go in with a word of prayer. Mark, whenever you're ready. Dear Lord, we come before thee this evening thanking thee for this opportunity that we have together here. Thank you for the safety that each and every one of us have, have, have had a safe trip to get here. Be with those that run this country. Watch over them, help them make the right decisions and keep us freedoms that we have that we can gather here without molestations of any kind. Be with us as we study your word that we do this in a well-pleasing and your pleasing in your man in your sight. All right. Forgive us of our sins. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, chapter 22. Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham. And said to him, Abraham, he said, here I am. Then he said, take now your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love. Go to the land of Moriah. Offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Uh, the very first thing that, that we grab here to think about is the idea that we're speaking about a place called the Mountains of Moriah. A lot of times people understand this as Mount Moriah. Anybody know the significance of Mount Moriah? What's the story about Mount Moriah, Josie? Isn't that where David was to build? Yes, you're right. Yeah. Build something. Build starts with an A. An altar. An altar. Yes. Yes, he built an altar there uh, for uh, to stop a great plague, uh, and then subsequent to that, what happened there? Temple. The temple is built on this spot. So, um, assumably, it's the same mountain which is really interesting when you think about that, because for one thing, it's, you know, the, uh, the idea of the symbolism here. Uh, remember, Mo Abraham's been to this place before, because years before, he was at that little tiny town at the foot of the mountain. What was the name of the town? At the bottom of the mountain where the temple was built, the town that's pretty important in the Old Testament, you know it. <laughs> Starts with uh, S and ends with Elam. <laughs> Salem, yeah, Jerusalem. Because remember, the temple's built in Jerusalem at the top of the mountain there. So at the bottom of the mountain, the city of David, the city of Salem, that's where Melchizedek was. Um, kind of an interesting thing if, if uh, as we said, we, we assume it's the same mountain, all the indication is. Uh, so what a profound thing that God says, I'm going to take you somewhere. You're going to sacrifice your son as a burnt offering to God. Verse 3 Abraham gets up early the next day and saddled his donkey, takes some of his young men with him, uh, and they leave. And you got to wonder here what uh, what all this is like. What's going on? Uh, as as everybody's mind is saying, as they they leave for the place that God says. The third day, Abraham looks off. He saw sees the place. Tells his young man to stay. <coughs> And he says, he, the lad and I will go on. Oh, by the way, um, the lad and I, the boy and I, kind of a strange terminology. Uh, we assume that this is about the same time that Sarah's going to die, maybe within just a short time afterwards. If that's the case, how old is Isaac at this moment? About 17. About 17, uh, so Sarah dies at 127. How old was Sarah when he was born? 90, 90, good, 90. So you're older than 17. <laughs> <laughs> you did New Mexico man. I know what that was. So he has uh, like 26, 27. Yeah, he's, he's about 37 years old, uh, if, if, if this is about that time. So I always think that's interesting, you know, to think. And like, so we're not sure, but uh, most of the, the ancient commentators always believed that these things were right on top of each other. In fact, they think that they're connected. They think that they're connected. I'll talk about that whenever we get to Sarah's death here in just a moment. But the point is, if they are at the same time, this isn't just a, a boy, as we sometimes think of. This is somebody in his 30s. I would actually be amazed. It wouldn't amaze me if he was actually 33. Like Jesus was 33. Yeah, that'd be interesting, wouldn't it, if he was 33 like Jesus was, Joseph? 
Well, he was old and big enough to carry wood up the mountain for his father. That's a great observation. Yeah, Joseph, that's a really good observation to think about there, that uh, he was old enough to carry the wood up there. Um, one of the things I think about is I think about this idea of what's happening here. Abraham, verse 6, takes the wood uh, of the burnt offering, laid it uh, on Isaac, his son. He took a plier, took a knife. They went up. Isaac asked the question, you know, Father, who got the wood? Uh, where's the lamb? Abraham says, God will provide. Uh, they go to the place, uh, I'm trying to get up to verse 9, and there he binds up Isaac and lays him on the altar. Now, what I think is interesting here is to kind of think about what's going on in this moment, especially if Isaac is not just a small boy, uh, if he's a good-sized person, uh, that Abraham ties him up. I mean, I think of, you know, if, uh, you know, if Tacho takes Zuli out and, uh, you know, Zuli, uh, you know, you're going to be the sacrifice, what do you think happens? I think Zuli starts running <laughs> <laughs> and I am fascinated that Isaac doesn't run, uh, that Abraham ties him up, and Isaac doesn't seem to fight. Isaac submits in this way. That's really interesting to me to think about what's happening in this moment. Go ahead. I get the impression from reading this that the wood that was placed on Isaac is emblematic of Jesus having had the, uh, carried the cross. Carrying the cross, yeah. The wood. Yeah. And Abraham, Abraham was telling his father and his son what to do, and his son is willingly doing it. Yes, yeah, and that's one of the things some people will say is that if Isaac is cooperating with this, what an interesting image of Christ cooperating with his death uh, to the degree that he carries the wood for which he'll be put to death. Well, if you notice in verse 5, though, and everything, where he tells, them, tells the others to stay there, and the, you were talking about the boy and I will go over there, and we will worship and return to you. Yeah. So, so you know, both of them sort of have the same mindset. God will provide. Yeah, but... Uh, so there was no worry that anything else was going to happen. <laughs> no, I'm going to ask a question here in a second uh, that's uh, really interesting about what you're pointing out, you know, and we will return. Uh, does Abraham... There's a yes or no question to start. Does Abraham think they're going to return? Yes, they do. That's exactly right. He actually does, but we have to know why. We have to know what's going on in Abraham's mind, and we will here in just a couple of minutes. So we'll come back to that. But, but Abraham thinks they're coming back, even though Abraham also thinks, I'm about to kill my son. There's something important in this kind of uh, reasoning that goes on here. So uh, Abraham takes these things, he brings out the knife, uh, he prepares to sacrifice his son, and will you tell me what happens? An angel stops. Yes, the angel of the Lord calls him from heaven, Abraham, verse 12, don't lay your hand on the lad, nor do anything to him, for now I know you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Let's stop here for a second. Go ahead, Tacho. I have a question. Yeah. Did Isaac hear the did he hear What that? a great question, Tacho, uh, which is a nice way of my saying, oh, I don't know. I haven't thought about yeah. that before. <laughs> Anybody ever thought about that? What do you think? You think Isaac heard this? Did Isaac hear the angel's voice say this? You know, it doesn't say. Um, but, uh, you know, I, he probably is hoping for anything to intervene, maybe. I don't know. You know, if you think about it, um, the, the, the people that was also going with Saul, when, when Jesus came down, did they hear him? The they heard something, they right? Heard something. They didn't know what it They was, didn't know what they were what hearing. Was, you know, but then you had uh, Peter um, and John and, uh, you know, yeah. on... The, um, when they went up to the mountain, you know, when um, Jesus revealed himself, yeah, you they know, heard, and, they heard and the voice said, yeah, this is my beloved son, so. You know anything? Actually, the one that pops in my mind, what was it, John 12, where the voice from heaven calls out, you've been glorified, and people say, well, I thought I heard thunder. Yeah. You know, so it's kind of interesting that there's a lot of times where God speaks and people say, you heard something, but I don't know what I just heard. Um, that yeah. might actually be a good answer. In a, in a book of yeah, um, here. People of... Um, up in the mountain when the Israelites came to um, Mount Sinai, you know, they, they were here. They were saying thunder. Thunder, yeah. You know, so, yeah. And I think, you know, it's interesting in Revelation, a lot of the times where God is talking, it's thunder. And I think that's an interesting thing uh, that, that characterizes about God. So the difference there, though, is this is an angel from God speaking to them. When angels have spoken other places, everybody hears them. That's true. The other is the Lord speaking or God speaking yeah. and stuff. 
and that's yeah, think about that. I can't think of a time where that wasn't the case. Uh, you're right, Paula. There are times uh, whenever the angel is speaking, it does. Yeah. Um, it is interesting. That, that's interesting, Paula. That's really a neat point to consider. Yeah. Um, that every time an angel spoke, it, it does seem like everybody heard. Um, I'll have to think about it because I got to rack my brain through. A oh yeah, that's oh, what I'll yeah, be yeah, thinking yeah, about yeah, the rest yeah. of the evening. <laughs> uh, boy, Stephen, and great. I talked about Mount Moriah and how that was Jerusalem, where David sacrificed and mm -hmm. Solomon built the temple. I get the impression, more specifically, that this is actually Calvary, where Abraham Abraham was. After doing quite a bit of study on this, that yeah. Abraham was sacrificing Isaac on Calvary. Of what would be well, now one thing, um, let's say this, that's a possibility. Now, but let's be clear to say Calvary is not the place where they built the temple. Right. Um, so so we would say that this isn't, you know, if we're identifying Mount Moriah, which First Chronicles, uh, stepping back for a second, uh, for, uh, Second Chronicles 3 verse 1 wants us to identify these things, um, then it wouldn't be Calvary. Now, by the way, here's a tricky question. Uh, Calvary is a what? Mm, good job, Wendy. Calvary's not a mountain. Uh, it's a misnomer. It's one of those things that, you know, we sing so many songs about Mount Calvary, but the Bible never calls it a mountain. The Bible never says that he was taken up a mountain or that Calvary was a mountain. It's, it's, a, it's just a misstatement that we have. It's, a, it's an interesting thing that uh, 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 we sometimes think. So we don't have a statement in the Bible that says Calvary was a mountain. But, but, but Calvary was right outside the walls of Jerusalem. Yeah, so it was yeah. really essentially part of Jerusalem in that sense. Yeah, it, of course, Jerusalem sits, there's these two valleys coming along, I forgot the name of the valleys, but uh, in Hinnom and, uh, and Kidron uh, are right on either side, so it's very possible, you know, I've always wondered if Calvary's not Hinnom, which is, you know, the place where they cast out their refuse and such, but, uh, you know, uh, you know, it, on the, on the, the eastern side, uh, the western side of the mountain. So we don't know for sure. But Stephen, it's an interesting thing if this might have been Calvary. We don't know. Like I said, I prefer the I prefer to identify it from what uh, you know as as the temple place, only because the language of Second Chronicles three puts it there. And like I said, Calvary is nowhere in the Old Testament, you know. And so I don't know where you know we don't have a sense of where Calvary might have been. But we do have this little clue about the temple. So that's kind of like I said, that's where I prefer to go. But you're right; it could be. And it would be interesting if it was. Greg, and then Ryan? Uh, on your angels. Angels are messengers. So I would hope everyone would hear them. So it's nice. possibly that they're supposed to be heard yeah. rather than when God speaks. Um, I believe he said you would die or if you heard So they to see the face of God. Well, the Israelites said, have God quit talking to us because we're afraid we're going to die. So that's yeah. kind of a neat uh, a neat comparison, right? I was just thinking about verse 7. It's interesting that it's clear that Isaac doesn't know Abraham's command because he's asking questions about it. So Yeah, where's the land? Yeah, he doesn't know. So I don't know if he knows uh, not until the end or, or if he knows in the middle or when he finds out. But that's what makes the story even harder, actually. Yeah, well, and again, um, you know, this whole thing, uh, I'm going to tie you up, I'm going to lay you on the, the altar, uh, what's going on there, and we don't know. Um, you know, we don't know if there's a conversation or not, and so we have to kind of uh, be careful of that. Michael, go ahead. My answer, it may sound like a silly question, but in my translation here, it says, do not lay a hand on the boy, but you said do not lay a hand on the lad, right? Yeah, yeah. So why, why do they have those variations? You know what? Uh, so King, uh, it may be that the, the King James says boy, what the New American Standard? Anybody can say Yeah, it just doesn't say American Standard says boy. Boy, yeah. Okay, so New American Standard says boy. Um, and all it is is that uh, the New King James likes to follow older <coughs> terms. We don't say lad as much anymore, but it wants a, a, the idea of a youth. Now, the idea of a youth usually is somebody who's a teenager, so that kind of causes us to think maybe we're talking about a teenager again. But the, the distinction of the term is mainly just the, what the translators wanted to do. So it's a good question, by the way. Well, I'm um, just interested. Yeah, translational variations are always interesting. And sometimes they're substantial. Sometimes they are a big deal. Uh, somebody's hand goes up. I was going to say, when you, when you look at pictures of, of artists that you know, how they thought of Abraham and, and Isaac and he was sacrificed. You always see Abraham, see Isaac always as a young man. Yeah, yeah. You never see him as an adult, you know? And so that's the reason why, it's like I said, their point of view is that he was young yeah. when Abraham tried to sacrifice him. Yeah. Not, you know, and so they don't realize, so wait a minute, 
the read about this is like, hey, man, was it so bad? He wasn't young. He was an adult. Yeah, yeah. Like I said, it, it seems almost certain, uh, putting putting it all together like this, that we're talking about somebody who's older. But, you know, why the terminology uses these young boy other than, you know, we'll call, you know, uh, you know, I go home and my father calls me the kid and the baby and, you know, all these different things like that. that and that's just maybe the father's reference. Tacho and uh, Stephen and... Oh, oh, yeah. I'm just wondering. Uh, did, was Isaac willing to go to him? Well, you know what? I've said before, I think maybe so. Um, to at least a degree, maybe he's not willing to die, but he's he's submitting to what his father wants him to do um, because I, I'm pretty confident he could have resisted. I'm pretty confident, um, although the question might be, well, why did he tie him up? I don't know. But uh, I'm pretty confident that he could have got out of this had he resisted and wanted to resist. But like I said, that's just my speculation based on putting a few things together. Steve, <laughs> <laughs> I, I was just I, I going to say that uh, uh, I think that uh, Isaac had very implicit faith in Abraham, just as Christ mm -hmm. had implicit faith in God himself. And that Abraham seems to be this figure of the Father, God the Father. Yeah. Christ the Son. Which is important for us to understand that in this moment, and, and we said this way back in our first Genesis class. That one of the reasons we need to know about Abraham is Abraham is one of the few people that steps into the place of God for a moment and, and has an experience that's like God's, uh, sacrificing his son. And that's pretty substantial because Abraham's also the only other guy that gets to be called our father. Remember the Bible says you have but one father, but what do we call Abraham many times? Our father of faith. So that's a significant point, right? Yes. Uh, you probably want to move on to this already, but uh, that on the language of calling him a boy, point out that in chapter 21, it calls um, uh, Ishmael a child, and we know that in that point, he was close to 20. So yeah, yeah. It seems that it's pretty loose. With that's the right. In verse 20 of chat chapter, it calls him a lad again. Um, so good point, Grant. Good point. Uh, about that. Well, let's let's say this. Why is this a big deal? So let's jump in the New Testament for a minute. And save you from flipping over there. I'll just throw the passages up on the screen here for you to consider. James chapter two, verse twenty-one. Here is James saying, "Hey, you want to know about faith? Let's talk about Abraham. Abraham, our father." Now, what's neat is that James could be talking to you know Jewish people, but I think he's talking to everybody. When he says, our father Abraham, he was justified. How was he justified? He says, by works, when he offered Isaac, his son, on the altar. Do you see that faith was working together with his works, and by works, faith was made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. He was called a friend of God. I want to pause here for a second. What's neat about this passage? is that James says that when Abraham puts his son up there, it fulfills a statement. Abraham believes it's accounted as righteousness. But here's the question. When did the Bible say Abraham believed that it was accounted to righteousness? Do you remember a few yeah, weeks when, ago? No, yeah, when, when, when God told him the first time. Yes! So what I think is really goosebumps kind of moment is that James is saying Abraham began his faith decades before but it wasn't fulfilled until this moment. And I think that's really remarkable to think about. The idea that his journey of faith wasn't a once and done thing, that his fulfillment of faith being credited as righteousness was something that took decades. And here at this moment, it's fulfilled. So this idea of the substance of faith in a sacrifice is profound. I'd love to camp, oh, I'm going to run us out of time if I do, but I'd love to camp on the idea to say the significance of sacrifice and that God calls all of us to sacrifice, to give up things, to put things aside in our life for his sake and his calling, and that that's the significance of the man Abraham in this moment. Not just that he believes God, but that he's willing to give up everything for God. It's a profound idea. Second passage I want us to know about is over in the book of Hebrews, chapter 11. In the book of Hebrews, it says, By faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. Uh, and he who had received promises offered up his only begotten son. There's a neat uh, expression, because only begotten son. Uh, where else? Yeah. Uh, it's a very specific Greek term, by the way. It means the only son that is of your nature. 
So, you know, the son that's like him, not Ishmael, his only begotten son, he says, of whom it was said, and Isaac your seed shall be called, concluding that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. Stephen? Can we just make a comment in your previous slide? Yeah. Up to this point, I don't think it ever says that Abraham was justified. He was definitely counted as righteous throughout the several chapters, but it's here that he's justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar. Yeah. Now, by the way, I want to say, this isn't the end of his faith, uh, or I'm sorry, the, the last act of faith that he'll do, but I do like the idea of a justification. You know, what are you willing to give up is the justification of your faith. And that, boy, that's profound for all of us to think about. What are, you, what are you willing to part with? That's the justification of your faith. That's a neat idea to think about. I like that, Stephen. I appreciate, I appreciate that thought. Well, we saw our statement here in Hebrews 11. And that kind of brings us back to what Paul has said a moment ago. Paul has said, hey, Abraham believes that they're coming back. So what, is it, what does he believe? What does Hebrew writer tell us he believes? Paul, you already know? No. What, is, what did he tell us? What does Abraham think is going to happen here? God's going to provide. Huh? Yeah. yeah, God's going to provide. Specifically, what, what was he looking that God could do? Bring them back. Yeah. Yes. So, so what we're seeing here, Paul hinted at it already that Abraham had said, we'll come back. And you're thinking, well, what? Well, Abraham believes God. He believes he's going to kill his son. And he believes God will bring him back. Now, that is unbelievable. Uh, not unbelievable, but it is extraordinary to think about for a moment. Because all of us live with a faith where we say to ourselves, I'm, I'm invested in coming back to life after I've died. But how many of us are so invested in it that we think nothing of the idea of, uh, you know, of, of of it leaving this life to go to the next one? And the answer is probably not many of us. It's probably not something that we have such a courage for, let alone a, a readiness to say, and I'm, I'm wording this carefully because I don't want anyone to walk away and say, hey, Brian said I'd kill my kids. <laughs> but such a confidence to say, I believe God's promise of a resurrection so much. Now, by the way, had God promised him a resurrection? Had God said, you kill your son, I'll bring him back to life? No. no. But did God promise us, if you die, you'll live? Yeah. So we got better than Abraham, right? But Abraham has so much faith in God that he knows, he knows God can do it. So he believes, and by the way, think of Abraham for a second. Uh, God said, when God said, you're going to kill Isaac, he didn't say, you're going to kill one of your sons, pick one. By the way, he's going to have more. Pick one of your sons. No, he says, the son that I made all my promises through, that's the son you're going to kill. So Abraham walks up this mountain thinking, I'm about to kill my son. And yet somehow God is still going to fulfill that promise. Do we get the idea that you might think, Abraham, I think you're crazy. Because you're believing two things that cannot be true. But Abraham does. And Abraham kind of reconciles his mind to say, he has the power to bring him back. So if I take his life, that must be what God's going to do. That's incredible. I don't have that kind of faith. I, I, I honestly worry sometimes, you know, if I got the resurrection right, you know, do I understand this? You know, God tells me explicitly what's going to happen. In 1 Corinthians 15, he says, here's what's going to happen, Brian. And yet still, I get a little anxious about it, thinking about it. And here's Abraham going up the mountain thinking, oh, I'm going to kill my son, but uh, God hasn't made the promise, but I know God can do it, so I trust him. That's incredible. That's remarkable for the kind of faith that Abraham has in this moment. Abraham is reconciling two ideas that don't work together. This is your son, the promise is going to come through, kill him. And he's saying they, they must somehow reconcile whatever it takes. I think that uh, uh, in Hebrews 11, 17, we learn, uh, that, and I think this is also in, it's actually in the Old Testament, in Isaac, your descendants shall be called. So he knows it's, uh, that Isaac can't possibly do both of these things. So there's yeah. got to be some kind of at least thinking, don't know how God's going to do it. He's going to yeah. do something. You know, and, and the thing is, so many times in our life, we're stuck in a moment where I don't know how God's going to do this. 
Abraham's faith is, but I know God's going to do it. And that's the faith that we're supposed to have. I mean, we have moments in our life where we're saying to ourselves, I don't know how this situation is going to be resolved. And yet Abraham says, but I know God can resolve it. And it can be extraordinary. However, it's going to be. God can do it. Um, I like the Hebrew writers to going on to say, you know, he kind of did get his son back from the dead because in his mind, his son was dead. He's raising up the knife to draw him out. That, that's not a, I'm hoping, I'm hoping it's not going to have to happen. That's a, I'm doing it. Which is when God stops him and says, now I know. By the way, those words, oh, they make my head hurt because I, I'm not sure why God says that. In fact, that's one of the things I wondered what you thought about that. Uh, but but uh, let's throw all these questions together, by the way, because I kind of don't see the answers being separate. Why does God ask this? Why, why is this test necessary? Why would God ask him to do this? I remember somebody once said, don't you think Isaac was pretty traumatized after this? And I thought, yeah, I, I would imagine. I would imagine every time Dad says, hey, we're going to a sacrifice. Well, why don't you take Ishmael instead? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I... Why did God ask him to do this? This is a big deal. Why? Why does he have to do this, Ryan? I have to think it's for Abraham. How so? So that he can see his faith in action. And really see it tested. Uh, do you think that's for Abraham? So one of the things we often point out about the things God says sometimes in the Bible that are kind of confusing is that God says a lot of things that are we could say anthropomorphized, that they're made something we would think so that we can kind of understand what's going on in that moment, that it might not exactly reflect exactly what God is thinking, but it reflects something for us to consider. So here's this statement, now I know. And what's interesting is Ryan says, perhaps the now I know is for Abraham to know how far his faith would go. So that's a great point. What else you got? What if it's also for us? just an example to us of what real faith is. Yeah. And how many millions of people have read that and been impressed with that. I, I think that's number one on the list of things that I see. What's why? The answer is, that's faith. That's the thing that God says, hey, you people that go to the Cornelius Church of Christ and visitors, hey, you people there, you know what? This is what you need to be like. You need to trust me this much. No, no, I don't. I struggle. I want to. I hope to one day, but this is pretty tough. I'm going to have to because guess what? My life's going to come to an end one day, and at that point, that's all I have. So I'm going to have to. But here, like Al said, here perhaps is God saying, I'm going to do something, number one, that I need people to see for thousands of years. This was 4,000 years ago. Uh, Abraham does this for thousands of years. I need people to look at this and say, that's how much faith God expects of me. Teresa, Grant, Stephen, there's Teresa next. Um, he had been obedient. Uh, everything God had asked him to do up to this point, he had been obedient, but this was the ultimate test. Yeah. To love God more than anything or anyone else, which is the same thing we have to do. Jesus yeah. said we have to love him more than family, more than anybody. Yeah, which again goes back to the idea of sacrifice. <laughs> that if we're genuinely committed to God, Jesus says then we have to hate everything else. Now, of course, we know hate means to love less, but here's a moment where Abraham hates Isaac. In other words, he loves God more than Isaac. Now, what did God say about Isaac? He says, your son, uh, in case we're not sure, the one you love. Your son that is beloved by you, you've got to take him out, you've got to kill him. And here is what God asks of us, that there can't be anything between us and him. Right. He's kind of already said it, but uh, to me, James 2 kind of makes it sound like without this action, this is where that faith becomes righteousness, is that if Abraham hadn't done this, then his faith would have been dead. Then yeah. It yeah. So, you know, it's interesting, Grant. How do we apply? James wants us to see that as an application for us. So what's that mean for us? They're going to be testing them. Constantly. And how many times did you talk about when you fall into trials or tests, count it all joy, uh, you know, because the testing of your uh, uh, testing produces, what do you say? <laughs> produces patience. patience, which leads to what? You know, 
But Peter, uh, by the way, Peter would say the testing produces faith, so it's kind of an interesting thing there too. But the whole idea that patience can have its perfect work in you, it perfects you. Stephen? I think what God might have been saying was, now I know that you know. In other words, Abraham needed to know, just as Brian was pointing out, prior to this moment, any future act on Abraham's, Abraham's part is purely speculative. It had to be performed, or in the process of being performed, without really almost being stopped, unless miraculously so, or providentially so, in one way or another, uh, for this to be known to the world, that Abraham went through it yeah. and was stopped by God. Yeah, so, so what's neat about that is it is a this proves it kind of moment. And I, and I like that idea because um, the concept of when we go through a terrible trial and we walk out faithful, how many times we look at ourselves and say, well, I did it, you know, well, I, I made it, you know, I, 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 yeah, I stuck with it. It was, it was terrible, but I stuck with the faith. And that's a profound idea, right? I was thinking, too, there are various times, uh, maybe the first century Christians were told, hey, deny your faith, or I'm going to kill your family, or kill you. Yeah. And sometimes you could you think back to the story and be really encouraged to stay faithful to God, even if that means giving up your family. Ryan, why would this story be an encouragement if you're, let's say you're, you're, the, you're the guy that the Romans come in and say, hey, you know, if you don't deny your family, or if you don't deny your God, we're going to kill your family. How do you, in that moment, look at this story and say, "I can, I can do this"? I think you would be maybe keeping your eyes on eternity. The fact that, that there, there's a promise, it's like Abraham. Different from Abraham, you don't have the promise of the, the chosen son and the land. You have the promise of heaven. Yeah. That if you don't give up, you get it. And that's why the way the Bible says in Hebrews, that really was Abraham's real promise, and that's really the thing Abraham was looking for. Because Abraham didn't expect to see things in his lifetime; he was looking for something else. Tom, do you ever hear that? Nope. Um, so, Anthony, go ahead. Also, I'm looking at it. We can see there's two, there's two sides in the Bible. When we talk about Abraham and his sacrifice and his faith. And then we also look at later on in the Old Testament, we talk about Jonah. You know, and what did God tell Jonah? To go out there and go to the Nineveh and preach the word. And what Jonah did? He didn't do it. You know, he went the other way. You know, and so it's really here. Here's an example. You know, when, <coughs> Like what, what Brian was saying is, is that when your faith is tested, what are you going to do? And that's the same thing. You know, <laughs> Abraham, when his faith was tested, he did what God commanded him to do. You know, when God asked Jonah and his faith was tested, what did Jonah do? He decided to go split. Nice. He didn't yeah. want to do it. You know, and that's the same thing with us today. You know, is when our faith is tested, you know, we what are we going to do? We have one either. <clears throat> What's that? Yes, be you. Your yes, be yes, or your no, be no. What is? What are you going to do? You know, and that's something that what Abraham it really tells you that um, in the end is that we don't. We're lucky. We don't have to do what God. God is not going to command us to say, "Okay, I want you to go sacrifice your first, you know, child." You know, the test to see if you if if you're actually. I'm going to do my will. But Anthony, let me, let me pause for a second and say, but what kinds of things will God tell us we have to sacrifice? Everything. Yeah. Let's be clear to say, not much less. In other words, you may have to give up oh so much for God. Uh, and we all have different sacrifices we'll end up having to make. And for some people, it's going to be extraordinary. Now, you're right. It's not going to be, you know, putting to death our, death our children. <clears throat> But it might be putting to death our flesh. It might be putting to death our our happiness, our you know our our circumstances of life. I mean, there's so many things people are called to do that are really hard. <coughs> the point is, you know, those are the sacrifices we have to make. I want to add a couple more things, and then I'm going to jump ahead. Number one, Ryan said something I want to jump back to. I thought maybe uh, we might follow up with it to say this. What, why does Abraham's story give us encouragement when we're down? And the answer I would say is the same reason why we're supposed to have got something out of the story in law. God delivers people in strange ways. You know, you don't know what might happen when you say, I'm going to stick with God, and suddenly nothing happens. You know what? And you've seen it in your lifetimes. I've seen it in my lifetimes where people stuck with God, and the circumstances that looked awful went away. It happens all the time. And God says about Lot, he says, if I can deliver Lot, from 
a, a, from a, a, a thousand people that want to kill him, surrounding him to destroy him, then I can deliver you from anything. You just don't know that God might deliver, how God might deliver you. And, you know, Paul says in his last letter, he was about to die, he says, God's going to deliver me. I don't know how. It's, you know, and it sounds like Paul thinks he's going to deliver me to the, you know, to eternity. But he says, you just don't know what God's going to do. You know, he writes in Philippians, I don't know what God can do. God can do anything. And too often we're so focused on what we can see happening that we don't think about the idea that, hey, if I'm committed to God, God's on my side, he can deliver me. And how many times, I, you know, I see people in a tough circumstance and I say, hey, stick with God on this. But if I stick with God, bad things are going to happen. Maybe. But you don't know what God can do. And that's a lesson from Abraham. So that's number one. Tom? Yeah, it's interesting that how we look at things. You know, we're willing to sacrifice the big things. And we say that. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be accountable until the point of death. And uh, over in Romans, uh, the uh, 12th chapter, what does he say? He says, present your body as a living sacrifice. He doesn't want your death. He wants you to live the life yeah. of uh, sacrificial life. And that's the accountability that we'll have. So it, it's, it's funny how we look at things. We're, we'll say we'll give up the big things, but we would barely give up the little things. Tom, Tom, you're saying something that makes a nice sermon, and it's true. Um, people say, I, I die for God. Well, would you come to church an hour earlier? Well, not that. Uh, but that's how people are. We think in terms of big things, and I don't know if some of that's because we think, well, I'll never get asked. But I think some of it's genuine. We think of the big things, but if it's something little, we don't want to do it. Remember Naaman? And God, uh, he came to make, what kind of big sacrifices was he prepared to make uh, before Elisha the prophet? He had some pretty big sacrifices lined up. What were they? Well, he was yeah, gold so yeah, he had tons of wealth, he had all these things, and when Naaman says, I was going to do something little, but he says, I'm thrilled to do something small. No, what did he say? He was insulted. He was disgusted. So there's something important to that. I wish we could stay more time on it, but we need to move on. Last thing I want to say, uh, this was kind of obvious, but it's worth saying. This is about Jesus. This is about what God is going to do with his son for our sake. But there's not going to be a stop. There's not going to be a uh, preventing it happening. This is going to have to happen with the Son of God. And so we're supposed to kind of get caught up in the drama of this moment and feel, you know, feel this terror with Abraham, but appreciate the idea that with God, it went through with it. And the Son of God died. Maybe, you know, Stephen said maybe in the same spot, but certainly within the same area. 2,000 years later. That's a pretty profound thing to think of. Um, let's kind of finish up the chapter real quick. Something that seems pretty trivial. Uh, uh, Abraham gets a letter, uh, and it came to pass after this. Abraham is told, hey, uh, your, your, uh, your brother Nahor has had some kids. Um, not necessarily anything too exciting, you know. <laughs> I don't know about you. Uh, no, more kids. Uh, just want to point out a couple of names here. Uz and Buzz, he talks about. Anybody know where those names come up? Uz and Buzz. Stephen, do you know? Joe. Joe. In Job chapter 1, Job was a man from the land of Buzz. And a little later on, he meets a fellow who's a descendant of Buzz. Who's that? Elihu. So Elihu is, uh, is related to Abraham. That's kind of an interesting catch for us to, to connect with Abraham with the book of Job. Uh, a little side note for us to to see there. So, uh, second though, he goes on to say, and he's had a son named Bethuel, and Bethuel's had a daughter named Rebecca. You know where we're going with that. We're going to meet her again here in just uh, a couple of chapters. Actually, next uh, uh, two chapters from now, something really neat's going to happen there. So, we'll go on to that. Last thing we talk about is Sarah's death. Kind of an interesting thing. I said that a lot of commentators tie these events together. Um, you know, the, the, the rabbinical tradition is that Sarah died as Abraham led Isaac out of camp. Now, it's a tradition, but I think it's kind of interesting to think of, you know, the idea of, you know, here goes her son, uh, you know, and, and by the way, you know, you have to wonder, did Abraham tell her what he was planning to do? What would that have been like if he says, hey, uh, Sarah, you know, that baby that you're so thrilled that you ran around telling everybody, you know, I laughed and God gave this to me. I'm going to take him out. I'm going to kill him. What might that have been like? Well, like I said, the tradition is it broke her heart, and she died of a broken heart. Um, I hope that's not true. 
Um, I can't bear to think of that. But we usually connect her death as being right on the cusp of this moment. Sarah dies after living 127 years, uh, and, and Abraham is going to mourn for her, and he goes out and he goes to the sons of Heath. Um, anybody know who the sons of Heath are nation-wise? That's it, very good, Josie. The Hittite nation, in fact, it kind of calls them Hittites here in just a little while. So he goes to them and he says, I'm, I'm a foreigner, I'd like property to buy. I'd like to, to buy something. Now what's kind of neat about that is that, why is this unusual? We've got a whole chapter about this negotiation. Uh, why is this kind of unusual, Josie? What do you think? Well, I just had a quick question. Oh. Are these the same Hittites that, that they destroyed for the Promised Land? Yes, um, interesting enough. So, so it's kind of strange because the Hittites were a great big nation of people up in what's today Turkey. And uh, you know, in a few hundred years, they're gonna kind of get wiped out and the remnants are gonna be throughout Canaan and God's gonna have them destroyed amongst the Canaanites. So, so the, the descendants of these people um, are connected to those people that are destroyed later on. So interesting enough. Now, now we might think to ourselves, well, you know, why so bad? Well, we've already met a couple of nations that in the time of Abraham were fairly friendly with Abraham. Uh, we've met, um, I, I, my mind is blanked out because I can't remember the name of the people, that uh, the Amorites. We met Amorites. Uh, they were Abraham's friends that he went to war with. And we've met Philistines, and, you know, Abraham made a covenant with them. So we have these nations that he dealt with. And the Hittites now, so these nations at this time don't have the unrighteous reputation that they have in the time of Moses 400 years later. <laughs> So it's an interesting comment, uh, observation to say right now they weren't, they weren't as disreputable as they would be when God orders them to be wiped out. Um, good question. So what do you think the significance of this chapter is about purchasing this land, this cave? Um, why is this kind of unusual? What do you think? What do you think, Joseph? Well, uh, it was in the land of Canaan, right? Yes, important. So, wasn't Canaan part of the promised land that Abraham didn't get to see because yeah. of what he had done? So, he was, um, not him. Um, Oh, Moses later on, uh, yeah, you're thinking of Moses. Uh, so Moses didn't get to go into it. You're right about that. Um, but you're right, Josie, to say what's important is that this cave is in the middle of the land of Canaan. So that's, that's our first significant point is to say, here's this little land. Number two, how much land has Abraham bought before this? None. What do you, how's he been living? He's a sojourner, a nomad. And well, the, because of his... Uh, him and Sarah doing a bad thing to the king, the king offered him, you can pick any part of my land you want to live on. He didn't say buy it. Yeah, he doesn't live give on. it to him. Yeah. So we often say that this is the only land Abraham will own that's in the promised land. So the significance of that uh, connects us to it. Um, let's kind of, we're at our time, so we've got to wrap it up quickly to say this. Why is that such a significant thing? Because Abraham's only connection to the promised land is his grave, is his death. What is our connection to our future promised land? Our death. Yeah, so it's kind of an interesting thing to make that connection to say Abraham's one thing to connect him to the promised land is his grave because he knows this life isn't where it's at. And that's, that's really big for us to understand. Anthony, you want to wrap this up? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah oh, I'm sorry. Also, it, it gives us the date. It gives us how old Sarah was when she died. That's right. That's She's right. the only woman in, in the Bible that actually gives us. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I forgot about that. And Anthony, why do you think that is? It just shows the, who, who she was. How, yeah. You know, I mean, because she was a she, woman of faith. You yeah. Know, and she and she believed, even though she laughed about some things. Yeah. You know, she that's okay. Yeah. So, yeah. We're talking about she's the God that she's going to have a kid. You know? She was an utterly godly woman. And First Peter chapter 3 says, and godly women today, you're her daughters if you follow her examples. And that's just a neat, a neat thing to say. Last thing, who else is going to be buried at this cave? <coughs> Isaac, Rebecca. Rebecca. Here's a trickier one. Jacob. Oh, I'm going to take the easy part. And who? Jacob. Jacob. Leah. 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 But not 
not Rachel. Interesting enough. Uh, kind of interesting who, that you have six patriarchs buried, buried in this cave. I don't know where Joseph was buried. Uh, he was taken, they took his bones to the promised land. You stumped the chunk. I, I congratulate you on that. I can't remember where it says. Uh, what's that? It's Shechem. You think Shechem? Oh, that's right. They did bury him in Shechem because they made the monument and buried his bones in Joshua. You're right. We're in your time. So I've been stumped twice. Uh, Anthony, give yourself a prime point uh, for that. And what do you mean? That's a yeah, valuable thing. I can hear what Tom said. He's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> oh, whatever. You guessed right again. <laughs> Good evening. If you could grab your song books and turn with me to uh, number 190. Number 190. Oh, Where my 
your markers at number 280, number fields next to our house, shooting at anything that will move, looking up at the sky and asking God, where are you? Continued on as I entered into college, not a good student, came there to play ball, had to take chemistry. That was the end of that athletic career in college. But I asked myself in that four hour class, that four hour lab, what am I doing here? We ask that question when we introduce, when we're introduced to the Lord, when we consider the Lord. For in Titus, the second chapter, in verse 11. So grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ who gave himself for us, that we might redeem us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. We talked about good works in the class tonight. Sunday, we read from Ephesians, the first chapter, and we read about that idea of good works, that we were created, we're his workmanship, created to do good works, which he prepared beforehand, good works. The problem that I had in chemistry is that I did not do the work, and that amounted to a failure. But God made us to do the good works and created them for us. We talked about Abraham tonight and the good work that he did before the Lord, and that was accounted to him as righteousness. Jesus Christ in Hebrews the tenth chapter is accounted and said that uh, about that he would be bringing many sons to glory. I love that particular phrase and what that means to us. Verse seventeen it says uh, he was there to make propitiation. In other words, he was to make the payment, the value of the sins that we had accumulated. Jesus came and brought grace to us. That grace was not grace of words, but grace through faith in him, Jesus Christ. Romans 8, chapter verses 8 and 9 are justified by his blood. And verse 8 uh, says that God showed his love even as we were sinners. He gave us a way out. That way out was accounted for us when Peter delivered his first sermon. And they asked the question, what should we do? And the answer was to repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Romans 6 chapter makes the statement that we are baptized into Christ. In the 8th chapter of Romans, in the first chapter, he says, there is no condemnation 
in Jesus Christ. That is the place that we need to focus on and make a surety that we are in there serving Jesus Christ. And so, as not many of us here have not been baptized, if you have not, now is the time to do so. We can make those arrangements. But for those of us, we need to make a claim and uh, make a place for us that we measure our faith by works. How are our works? Do we consider ourselves? Can we consider our works enough to justify us? God is looking for that, has placed us to do it, has placed those works for us to do it, and we need to grow up in doing that thing. If you're with us tonight and we can help you in any way, you can come forward. We will accept your confession of Jesus Christ, or we will pray that you will work better or consider uh, any problems you might have. We'll be happy to pray for you. So if you come and uh, stand and sing the song that Al selected, we'll be helping you at that time. I have decided to Um, one is an observation. Last 